projectionist, stop the show. Here's great news you ought to know. We've just got a shipment of taste thrill treats, all tip-top quality and delicious eats. Welcome to At The Movies With Smokey. If you're wondering why I didn't make a review video on Jurassic World 2, it's because I really didn't want to talk about such a ridiculously dumb and just unintentionally hilarious movie. But, if I had made a video about it, here's what I would have talked about. It's a bad movie, it's just the lost world like everyone expected. The Jurassic franchise has become paleo entertainment in the same way that wrestling is sports entertainment. I was laughing throughout the entire film. The plot line and the characters are so dumb and just nigh nonsensical. Are Jurassic Park 2 and 3 even canon anymore? They planet of the apes dinosaurs. Even though it seems pretty damn easy to hunt them down, there were at least like 20 or so, maybe, that were released into the wilderness. Doesn't seem that hard to hunt down a fucking dinosaur. Owen is just Ian Malcolm, except less cool. Claire is Laura Hardy. Uh, they even have the same hair color. Franklin and the vet woman, I can't remember her name, are both Vince Vaughn. Uh, clone girl is the daughter. She's a clone! <laughs> They're cloning people! They've cloned at least one person in the Jurassic uh, universe. I bet you didn't see that adoption coming, huh? How unexpected is that? Also, she's a fucking clone. Toby Jones just did his best Jimmy Stewart impression during the film. Where the fuck is the mansion located? Is it somewhere in the UK? They all seem to have British accents for the most part. Yet, at the end of the film, Blue is running through the fucking suburbs. And I'm pretty sure it's near at least like a desert or some very mountainous terrain. It feels like the director just wanted to make it a horror movie, but the studio kept telling him to shut the fuck up and make the kids like it for the money, baby. I was very confused by Hammond's old friend. I thought I had totally forgotten a character from Jurassic World. I like the animatronics. It's a very dark movie, literally. Like, it's always fucking raining, whether it's water or lava. They killed Jurassic Park. They destroyed the original Jeep. They brutally killed the Brachiosaurus, the first dinosaur that we ever saw, and the last one that we ever saw as it slowly died. <laughs> From the fucking volcano. They destroyed the island, and they even smashed the amber cane. Like, what the hell? This is no longer Jurassic Park. They have diverted so far into left field. But I fucking love it. It's gonna be insane when they make the third film. Like, what is it gonna be about? Just people coexisting with dinosaurs? Or are, like, they gonna take over parts of the world? I give this movie a thumbs up. And if you want a longer, well thought out, uh, and funnier review of Jurassic World. Check out Jenny Nicholson's video. I'll put a link in the description or the video or something. I don't know. Maybe there's a great box appearing to the top right right now as we speak. Now on to a much better film. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Warning, there will be spoilers. Peyton Reed. Hi, I'm Peyton Reed, director of Ant-Man. He is back after his first directorial debut in the MCU three years ago with Ant-Man. And along with a great cast of characters and actors, a fun story, and ants. Ants. Ant-Man. So let's just begin with what I didn't like about the film. I may be pretty biased towards this movie since Janet Van Dyne is one of my favorite characters. Uh, so if you're hoping that I really bash this film for whatever reason, you've come to the wrong channel. I love the Gogs, man. I can't get enough of him. I love him. But what the hell was the point of his character? So that he could give Hope and Hank the part for their machine? That could have been any other Marvel character other than, uh, Ber Bertram? What the fuck is his name? I don't know, he's not an important character at all. He dies after, like, four issues. <laughs> he kills himself. But really, like, what did he do in this film? He just drove around in a white and gold Escalade and ran around with a little tiny building under his arm like he's a bad football player? Or just be Southern? Like, all they were there to do was just add characters for Luis, the Joker's henchman, and T.I. to interact with and talk about truth serum and show Luis's super fist. Seriously, like whenever he fights someone, he knocks them the fuck out with a single punch. While I enjoyed Ghost as a character, and also the fact that Hannah John Kamen is absolutely beautiful, I did not enjoy that exposition dump for why she is all quantum-y and like, ghost-like, I guess. Also, when did they decide to start calling her Ghost? Was it off-screen and I just like spaced out for a scene, or did Scott just start doing that? Okay, but really though, let's, let's be serious about the worst part of this film. Let's move on to Jimmy Woo. Played by Randall Park, a.k.a. Jim Halpert from the critically acclaimed show, The Office. Woof, uh, Jimmy Woo. I know people are, uh, and will be upset 
that they made Jimmy Woo from a pretty badass man from the 50s whose friend is a gorilla secret agent into some goofball who loves magic and is just way too innocent for this world. And I'll tell you how I feel about this goddamn atrocity. I've barely read anything about Jimmy Woo. It's not like Marvel's gonna make a fucking Agents of Atlas movie anytime soon. Maybe Uranian will be in the Captain Marvel movie. But I don't, I don't care. I loved magic-loving, somewhat awkward Jimmy Woo. He was great. This isn't the main Marvel Universe. This is Elseworlds, baby. Haha. <laughs> and see what I did? I secretly went into things I did like without telling you. I shrunk it down like a little tiny ant and put it on screen very quickly. Go back and try and see if you can find it. So let's move on to what I did like about the film. First of all, I cannot believe that they alluded to Hank being Janet. Uh, Bill Foster says, like, something along the lines of alluding to spousal abuse to, like, provoke Hank when they're in his office. And, like, Hank gets very upset and I'm pretty sure he's, like, spouts off, like, how it's not true or something. Something along the lines to defend himself. And tries to fucking kick Bill Foster's ass. And then when Janet is in Scott's body, she says, Our first fight in decades, and it's over just like that. Which, I mean, could be due to the past 30 years Janet has spent inside the quantum uh, microverse realm, and they just haven't been able to communicate. Or it could mean that they just rarely ever fought, and if they did, it was quickly settled. Peacefully. I don't know, I didn't take that as Hank like, once accidentally hit his wife because the artist misinterpreted the script. I loved Evangeline Lilly as Hope. Uh, holy shit, she's absolutely badass. I loved her fight scenes, and I'm glad that we finally got a version of the Wasp in live action. Paul Rudd, as usual, is hilarious. <laughs> I can't, can't believe little kid Rudd. It was it's just so odd. I wasn't expecting that to happen. It was weird. <laughs> Just a, just a tiny little Paul Rudd running around. And I'm glad that Marvel is allowing the weirdness to grow in their films. Because that shit definitely wouldn't have happened like six years ago. Also, I was definitely expecting someone to call the cops on the trio when what appears to be a young child gets into a panel van with an old man. Also, the fact that the theme that plays is just the sped up version of the normal Ant-Man theme is great. Scott is also an amazing father. Like, holy shit, man, that cardboard ant tunnel playhouse slide adventure edutainment was outstanding. Like, also car tricks. Like, how does he do it? Michael Douglas was good as Hank. He's the same old grumpy old son of a bitch until Janet gets back and then his icy heart is melted or something by Janet. I like that he did his heart attack trick again. Isn't isn't that something he did in the first film? It definitely is, right? Uh, I enjoyed Ghost as the villain. Uh, I'm doing air quotes, but you can't see him. She just didn't want to fucking die, man. Like, that's her whole thing is she doesn't want to die and she's trying to save her own life. Which brings up the question of what is the time scale of this movie? I could have sworn Bill Foster told her that she had at least, like, weeks to live and then later near the end of the film it's revealed that she now has days to live so I'm guessing that the film took place over, like, like three weeks, maybe? Actually, no, that doesn't make any sense because isn't it three days until Scott is uh, on parole or something? Maybe her condition was worse than they expected. I'm really glad that they didn't kill any of the villains in this film because that means we're one step closer to the Thunderbolts. Also, her dad is Egghead. I couldn't fucking believe that. When I heard the name Elias Star, I was like, who the fuck is that? I, I recognize that name. What, who, what character is that? And then after I got out of the theater and I was walking to the exit on my phone, I looked it up and I could not believe my eyes. When the group are being led to the uh, lab after it's gotten stolen for the upteenth time, um, they follow some sort of flying insect that Hank summons. They can track down where the lab is and to give the group directions instead of just flying like a normal large swarm of insects, they turn into literal arrows. They turn into giant arrows, like the scene in Finding Nemo. <laughs> Why? Why do they do that? Uh, I absolutely loved Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet Van Dyne. 
uh, from the moment she turned around and it was somewhat de-aged Michelle Pfeiffer with like the original Janet hairstyle and her attitude and the tone with Hope and also when Paul Rudd was playing Janet in Scott's body I loved the character it's exactly what I wanted but come on Paul Rudd as Janet Van Dyne was absolutely amazing through the end of the film I was getting really worried that Janet wouldn't make it out of the quantum realm or that she'd die or sacrifice herself or that Ghost would kill her and Hank or that Ghost would just kill her but god was I relieved when none of that happened and I was actually getting a little emotional when the family was finally reunited Stan Lee's cameo was marvelously meta it's something like the 60s were a wild time and now I'm paying for it that's not a very good Stan Lee impression Excelsior uh, my favorite aunt besides Scott aunt who I'll talk about in a little bit and aunt Antonio Banderas was the ant who had to clean the fucking floors of the laboratory. The ex-con group was all great. <laughs> I loved Kurt's Baba Yaga lines. And Luis was great. Again, I loved his recaps. They're even funnier this time around. Uh, now we just need to get Danny DeVito as Modoc and Christopher Walken as the stranger, and we'll have a Batman Returns reunion. I really liked uh, Cassie, Scott's daughter. She was funny, and damn, are they pushing for her to become stature. And like the entire cast was just great in this film. Something else I also enjoyed was that Michelle Pfeiffer had her own hairstylist. I don't know, it was just something I noticed during the credits. Speaking of credits, let's move on to those credit scenes. Jesus. Such a nice, somewhat lighthearted, fun film just comes snapping back to reality that is the MCU. The mid credit scene has Janet, Hope, and Hank all being dusted from the snap, which is odd that they are just like on the top of some car park, <laughs> going about their normal business of collecting quantum stuff for Ghost. And I do like that she, like, reformed, I guess. I don't know. I guess reform is the right word. Anyway, they're doing that after another alien invasion happened the same day. Maybe they had a plan of some sort. Okay, possible major spoiler for Avengers 4 is coming up, so go to this time code to skip it. I'll give you a few extra seconds. Before Scott uh, goes into the quantum realm in the mid credit scene, Janet tells him to watch out for time vortexes in the quantum realm. And people have been theorizing that this could mean that while he's trapped in there, or down there, I guess, he fucks up time somehow by using these time vortexes. And that is the reason why the leaked photos of Avengers 4 show the uh, 2012 era cap, like, running around on set. And why there are also rumors of time travel being a part of the film. Or maybe he's just not in Avengers 4 at all. And that after credits scene. Holy fuck. The world is fucked. All that's on the TV is just the multicolored emergency broadcast with the siren blaring as the Scott Ant Scant? Scant? Ant? Plays the drums. And I want to know how long that is after the snap. Because Scott Ant uh, is programmed to do Scott's everyday routine. And with no one to end the program, I guess it'll just keep going and playing uh, Drum Hero as the world slowly crumbles into chaos. Anyway, altogether, I really enjoyed this film. It's a fun break between the Avengers films. It's a fairly small level story, um, just like the first Ant-Man. Sounds weird to say, much more grounded film compared to the uh, recent Marvel films. Now we have to wait about eight months until Captain Marvel comes out. And then after that, it's only a few months until the grand finale of the current Marvel Cinematic Universe. I really hope that they make a third Ant-Man movie. I will definitely see it. And I give Ant-Man and the Wasp a thumbs up. And you should absolutely go and see this film. Well, that's all for this episode. I've been your lovely host, Smokey. And make sure you leave a comment on what you thought about the film and or any theories you have. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, give it a like and check out my other video series on comic books. That's right, I've started advertising myself at the end of videos. So, goodbye for now. I'll see you next time.